As we get a little closer to the opening bell, let's get back to our guest host for his insights on the bond markets and, more specifically, the importance of liquidity around the world. Rick Reeder is chief investment officer of Global Fixed Income at BlackRock, where he oversees more than $2 trillion in fixed income assets. And, uh, Rick, let, let's just talk about something we were talking about off camera before. It's a lot more difficult to move in and out when you are moving <clears> such a big portfolio. Well, I think, I think liquidity in the markets is, uh, is rough across the board. There, there's this weird construct today. By the way, one of the things I also point out that I think is amazing, we have the Fed, and it's, it's a good thing that we're actually not talking about it today, and actually the Fed's gone to the background. But one of the things the Fed's doing is providing tremendous amounts of liquidity. People talk about what they're doing rate. They're putting huge amounts of liquidity, and they did it for the repo. They're doing it other, because they need to for the balance sheet and the dollar, et cetera. But what's interesting is there's a lot of money to go in the market, huge amounts, why markets continue to elevate. But conviction is really low. And you have this incredible paradox today that, gosh, whether it's the virus, whether it's the impeachment, whether it's uh, the election, who's in so conviction is, so you think about when you talk about Boeing stock, you think about, gosh, where are the places that I need to go that I feel like I'm going to be pretty well protected? And what are the hedges that I have on? But because conviction is low, the depth of some of these markets is amazingly thin, given liquidity out there. Does that explain some of the lack of volatility? Because conviction is missing, so you're not going to run th something up really sharply, and you're not going to run it down really sharply either. So I'd say there are a couple of things that are keeping volatility down. One of them is because the amount of money that's going into the system, markets are, re are pretty darn stable generally. The other is, when, you know, part of what I don't believe in negative interest rates, one of the things it does is people sell volatility as a way to, to generate carry, as a way to generate return. I actually think one of the best assets in the world today, if not the best, is to buy volatility because you can actually manage your portfolio extremely well with volatility in the equity markets, rate markets, currency markets. It's one of, actually one of the gifts that uh, because of easy monetary policy to some extent and liquidity in the world, it's one of the gifts to, uh, to manage portfolios today. Is that a potential risk at some point? I mean, I just, I, I just wonder what, what unwinds, what causes <laughs> that, what kind of potential? So, Becky, I mean, one of the things that, that people don't talk about is the pro-cyclical nature of the markets today. Because of that, selling of volatility, because of this dynamic that's out there in terms of different types of assets that have been raised in volatility form. When the market goes up, it almost has to accelerate, and then when it goes down, it does the same. So you think about what we've had this week alone. You think about Monday. Markets were trading down, markets were trading down, and the thing you hear a lot about is all of a sudden you're going to hit volatility triggers, all of a sudden you're going to hear levels, hit levels that people have to sell more because of the way they're managing their books. That's really different. So you can have days like that are completely dichotomous to one another, where you could have a day like Monday, then a day like Tuesday that's completely different. I don't know why. These are they're different markets. By the way, I actually think the most interesting markets have been around a long time. I, the fact that we're not talking about the Fed, it's such a nice thing to not to follow every single word of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> yes, you can totally. actually, you can actually you live, look at different companies. And, may you live in interesting times, though. <laughs> do, you know, the, the Chinese proverb, do you really want that when it comes to markets? When you say interesting, what does that mean? So the ability, I mean, think about today. I mean, just, you can get engaged on every one of the stories you've talked about today. And you think about, you know, there's a lot of things happening in the world with technology, the digitization of commerce that I think is the most exciting thing we've ever seen as investors in terms of different businesses. Look at the companies you talk about, Apple, et cetera. Who is on the right side of that? By the way, it's not just tech companies. Who are the companies that are actually, have gotten on the right side of logistics, technology, data assimilation into their business? And you want, those are the companies you want to get on. So there's real differentiation going on. You look at, as you're describing over the last, not just the last week or so, the last few months, who's actually, some companies are really underperforming. They're just not on the right side of that. And that's, that's where I think it's really cool to try and find uh, opportunities. Talking about opportunities, can we talk about Tesla? Yeah, absolutely. That's where I wanted to go with you yeah. because we're going to be hearing from them this yeah. afternoon. Yeah. Listen, I mean, the last time I was on, we had this long discussion about their technology and uh, Listen, I, you know, I shouldn't talk about individual companies, but I, you know, listen, I think the technology evolution of what's happening and you know, your ability to actually produce cars at lower price points and the energy dynamic in terms of how you're utilizing it, the services you're providing through it. Listen, I don't know what they're going to report or what have you, but I think people have underestimated for a long time it's a better technology, it's more efficient, and the ability... Does the valuation of the company make sense to you? So listen, for a long time, I, uh, you know, I've thought it was, you know, on your show many, many times, I've thought it was too low. Now, you know, it's gotten up there now. I mean, you, you, you know, where you have to get to to, uh, to match this valuation, you know, for the first time in a while, you don't feel like lightening up a little bit is not a bad, not a bad idea. But the, uh, listen, I think this is going to be a company, a durable business, and you're going to see others that are in it that are behind. And I would say one thing that I know we talked about last summer on the show, you know, it, it's, to a large extent, it's an efficient energy company. And I think... Deliver services. You think about a company's delivered services and provided efficient 
transportation through energy. By the way, look at what GM just announced. It's a complete revolution in transportation that's going on, that it's going to hit more circles of transportation, energy, logistics, and I think people give credit to, and I think they're at the forefront of it. You're long the stock. What's the... Yeah, I'm not so stuck, but you know, we you know, like the company. I mean, I think it's a uh, it's a good business. And uh, listen, I think your point about valuations today—it's moved up a lot. Yeah.